Hello everybody and welcome to our next video in the series on model selection. And this one actually will combine everything that we've seen until now and finally we're also going to see an example for all the techniques that we have discussed, right? This concerns um, regularization, um, cross-validation for selecting regularization parameters, in particular the lasso algorithm. And what I want to do now is I want to use a very simple example that we see here to start with to discuss what we have seen in terms of regularization and, and parameter selection and so on. And then we are going to study a very specific example. Okay, so before we dive into what I've already started writing down here, let's consider these initial steps. And then I will, you know, switch off the code for a second. We will discuss this specific example, which is going to be the sparse identification of nonlinear dynamic systems, which is a, a great algorithm developed by Steve Brunton, Josh Proctor, and Nathan Kutz, to see how the lasso really performs in action. But before we get there, let's start with a little code example. And here I've just, let's say, more or less randomly created a superposition of two sine functions with different frequencies and then added Gaussian noise to get these points that are going to be our data points. And in this case, it's just, you know, the input is one dimensional and the output is one dimensional. And I'm trying to fit a polynomial dictionary term, so polynomials to these points, okay? And so what you can do is you can, we have seen this a lot of times, the OLS regressor is simply, you know, we select a model of Q terms, which are just the weights times the input raised to the kth power. And so this is what we get as a feature vector, z raised to the q minus one power at max, right? because of the bias term we then have. Okay, so this should start at zero, so we get the zero term and then, then these terms. Um, what we get is a feature vector and then we can use the rich regression algorithm that we have seen before. Um, so if we do not re regularize, so the default value would be lambda zero, this is just the pseudo inverse times the output. And this will give us uh, the OLS estimator, and if we set lambda to not a zero value, we get a rich um, regression algorithm where we regularize with respect to the two norm of the input weights, right? And then there's just how to evaluate the model and how to evaluate the loss function. And what you can do now is you can estimate this for different values of Q, right? So how many degrees of freedom we have, and I have chosen 30 samples, so 30 is the maximum we can go, and basically this would lead us to ideally a zero fit, but for numerical inaccuracies, you don't get a perfect zero fit, but usually you would expect a massive overfitting to, to the data. And so all I'm doing now in this uh, loop is performing the rich regression without the lambda, so it's the non-regularized version, just OLS, and compare the in-sample loss and the out-of-sample loss on a very fine grid between minus two pi and plus two pi. Okay, and so this is the loop that you get. You see always the in-sample loss and the out-of-sample loss. And so as expected, the more you increase the Q, the smaller the in-sample loss becomes. And in the end, the out-of-sample loss increases and in the end, completely horribly, right? And this is, if you look at the figures, you see exactly this behavior that you have um, with a small polynomial, a line, you have a large in-sample loss, but you have don't have this overfitting problem. Whereas in the end, for higher degrees of freedom, you see, in particular towards the ends, left and right, you really have this horrible overfitting, which results in a, in a very poor generalization performance. And you can also see that these are the weights of the individual polynomials that are in the order of one, and then they decay for higher degrees, but still you have considerably important values for, for higher degrees, and this is, these are responsible for these strong oscillations. And so what we have seen before is rich regression. So you just regularize with different lambda parameters for the highest polynomial. And so what you see is the more you regularize, um, the more you can account for this, this behavior, right? It's still not perfect because at the left and at the right, you have this horrible overfitting behavior. But in the middle, you see you get a nice fit. And if you overdo it with the lambda, you see that you get you know, underfitting, basically. Okay, so nothing new here. Same pro problem, the weights are all non-zero, okay? And so this is why we introduced the lasso and the L1 regularization. Okay, so here's once more the, the problem that we have discussed in a lot of detail in the, in the previous videos. And here's, you know, the mathematical derivation that we did to get the derivative for uh, the, the, the coordinate descent where we got this row term independent of 
wj, the phi term also independent of wj, and then you can solve this for wj. And you get this case distinction that we had before, exactly as in the last video. And so you can simply implement this um, by a function that calculates rho and phi. You just have to write the data, the w vector, and the index j, which is the active index. And so this is exactly what we did in the, in the mathematical derivation to get rho and phi. And then the optimization for wj is simply as we had it before. We have this case, this case. if rho j is less than lambda half, you get this rule for rho j. If it is greater than lambda plus, uh, plus lambda over 2, you get this rule for the regularization. So here's an additional n term because, you know, we did not talk about 1 over n. I, I've done 1 over n in the code to, you know, scale the two appro appropriately and to get more independent of the data. But still this is very much in spirit to what we have done before. And if it's not smaller than minus lambda over 2 or not greater than less, so it's in the interval, then the wj opt is 0. And then the lasso algorithm is simply to go cyclically through these coordinates until the improvement is small. Okay, so what I've done here is the relative improvement is less than 1%. Or we have a maximum of, I think, 10,000 iterations should this not converge. I have said this is not the newest state-of-the-art algorithm, so it tends to be rather slow, but still it does the job. You, know, you may need a lot of iterations because, you know, clearly once you change one weight, the other changes as well, and so you have to go through all the Ws many, many times. And so if we do this, uh, so the next one is nothing but calling the lasso for different lambda values. So this is really the validation task if you think about this. So we run this lasso and here it's not validation because I'm not setting aside any data. I'm just comparing what the lasso gives me for different regularization parameters. And so here this is what's important, the loop. So you get the original loss function which is increases with increasing lambda values, which makes sense because you put more emphasis to the one norm. And on the other hand, you see that the one norm goes down, which also makes sense because with increasing lambda, you put more emphasis on this, this one should become smaller. But what's interesting is the out of sample performance has a sweet spot somewhere in the middle, okay? So clearly there is a good place where to select the lambda. And the performance is if we plot this, um, something like this, where you see the very small values have this horrible overfitting behavior at the ends. Two large lambda values will give you this underfitting behavior. And there is a sweet spot somewhere in the middle, this orange line maybe, or this, this light blue line. Somewhere in this region is where we have a good out-of-sample performance. And so this can now be used in regularization. But what's more interesting is, you see here, this is the one norm over these different regularization runs. And this is the zero norm. So I've counted how many terms are non-zero in my polynomial dictionary. And you will see that from these terms on, we have actually reduced the number of active terms to six. Whereas the original dictionary had, I think, 30 terms, right? Remember, we chose a polynomial of degree uh, 29 and the bias term. So 30 degrees of freedom, so 80% are zero, and we have a good performance. So this is what sparsity and forcing does for us. And now um, we can use this for cross-validation. So all you need to do is you need to delete a subset of your data. So you sample this IDEL, so which samples to delete. And you train on the samples you have not deleted and you validate on the, the part you have set aside. And then you can repeat this n rep times and then take the mean as your, your validation loss. And so if you do this, you get this sort of um, bit randomly looking curve, but you see that it somewhat um, confirms what we have seen before, that somewhere in the middle there seems to be a sweet spot between 10 to the minus 4 and 10 to the minus 3 somewhere, okay? So this is, in the cross-validation, um, a sweet spot for how to select the lambda value. So model selection using cross-validation. And before we continue now, um, what we're going to do next is the sparse identification of nonlinear systems. Um, I'm going to turn this off and talk a little bit about what's on the board and what we want to do here, okay? So we have seen that this is our lasso problem. So minimize uh, W times Z, so the linear model minus the output plus this regression term, okay? Um, and so what we can do now is we can try to find equations from data, which is really nice, right? Let's say you have 
experimental data, you have measurements, and you say, okay, maybe I can identify what gave rise to these data, to these dynamics. Huh? And so all you have to do really is you say my output is x dot and my input is psi of xi. So what I'm doing is my, I'm considering the system state and the time derivative and this psi is a dictionary. So I'm lifting my input, so the system state n dimensional to a higher dimensional feature space and my output is the x dot. And so what I get is I get a model right in the end that hopefully will give me psi of x times w means x dot, right? And you see this is rather similar to, right, if you turn it around, something like x dot equals f of x, so an ODE. Right? And so if we can find the w, um, then maybe we have found a dynamical system. But what the key observation is that in nature, usually we have only a small number of mechanisms that gives rise to dynamics, like Newton mechanics, or we have heat conduction in PDEs or convection. So certain mechanisms, physical mechanisms that give rise to, to the dynamics, so few terms. And so the idea is we define as psi a dictionary of possible right-hand side terms, and these can be well, arbitrary terms. You, know, you can take x1, you can take products of these, monomials of higher order, you can take sines and cosines, so this is limited by your imagination only, so it can be a very large dictionary. And here comes the key, let's use lasso to identify the meaningful terms, okay? So what we simply need to do now is we minimize over a weight matrix now, because we do not have a single output, we have n outputs, so the number of equations, right? So this was always the univariate case. Um, w is now an, uh, if you do it like this, Q times n matrix. And so what we're minimizing over is the output, which is the big x dot matrix where we collect all the, the right-hand side data, minus the z matrix, or let's just write it directly as, as, as it's supposed to be, this psi, so lifting my input in terms of all these dictionary terms of now a matrix, so I've collected all the data here, times this w matrix. Uh, sorry, this is the Frobenius norm now if we're talking about matrices. And so what we can do here is we can add this penalty term. And now things become a little bit tricky because it's, you know, the one norm is different for, um, for the individual components. So what I'm going to do is I'm, you know, just writing it like this because the operator norm is something different, what we will do is actually we will do this component-wise. And then it becomes really the classical problem. So this is in quotation marks because this is a different norm. What you do is you do it component-wise. And then this becomes a true norm for the, col for the rows of, of this matrix, okay? Sorry, for the columns of this matrix. Um, okay. So really, the Cindy algorithm is applying the lasso to a very specific setting where we have x dot as our output, x as our input, we lift it in terms of a feature dictionary and then find the weights with a sparsity term, sorry, this was like this, with a sparsity term, component-wise, otherwise this would not make too much sense, and then try to find the dynamics. So let's look at it. And this is really what the code is about. And we are going to study the Lorentz system, right? So a very, very classical ordinary differential equation, nonlinear. So here it is, three components. And I've used these standard parameters that give rise to chaotic behavior. So if you insert the parameters directly, you will find this minus 10x1 plus 10x2. So we should remember these numbers because we will hopefully find them in our regression problem. And then there's a 28x1 minus x2 minus this product, x1, x3. And here you have minus 8 over 3, x3, and another nonlinear term, x1, x2. And so the right-hand side is just defined here exactly as, as it is above. And then we can use a runge kutta scheme of fourth order to do the time series prediction. And so what you get um, over a certain period of time, you get this very well-known Lorentz attractor from three different projections, so this, this butterfly-like shape. 
And so now let's try to identify this from data, right? So uh, first we start with a dictionary. So I've you know, not bothered with some specific library, but this is to make things very easy, a hard encoded dictionary, which starts the constant term, the linear terms, quadratic terms, cubic terms, and fourth order terms. Right? And so you see, if you do this for three components, you get 35 uh, Q is 35 in this case, right? So 35 parameters. And now we fit a regression matrix 35 by 3 because we need to identify the coefficients for every component. So we solved the original lasso problem three times for the individual components of the dynamics. So what we're doing is we are solving exactly this, right? Minimize the individual components. This is 1, 2, 3 um, Q dimensional, which is 35 dimensional to match this input output mapping plus this regularization term okay and so what you will find is this multivariate lasso is nothing else but doing this component wise so you see two loops the one goes over the three components and the inner one goes as before um, cyclically through the indices and so you see right it's basically three times the lasso problem wrapped around and so what we can do now is we, um, what I've done here is I collect, let me go back one second, I've collected data in this fashion. So I have my X data is the runge kutta trajectory and the XD, this is my, my output here, is X derivative, so X dot. Um, and this is just for all points I've evaluated the right hand side of the ith sample. So it's an exact X and X dot matching, so no noise whatsoever. And what we can do now is we can evaluate the lasso algorithm, or even simpler, we can simply use it with lambda equals zero. So basically what we have is we have our classical regression problem. Um, so we lift our input into this dictionary, and then we find the coefficient that um, map these uh, forward. And so what you see, we get in the first equation minus 10, this is the first row is the bias term. So minus 10x1 plus 10x2. So if you recall, this was exactly the first equation. And the rest is numerically basically zero. You see 10 to the minus 10, 11, and so on. And so in the second equation, you find 80, 28 times x1 minus x2, and then we had this x1, x3 cross term. So you get the minus one here. And in the third equation, you get minus eight over three times x3, and here one, so this was x1 times x2. So you, we have identified the system, right? So given data, we have identified it, but we have used the most simple case where we have no noise whatsoever. So to make things more interesting, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add uh, Gaussian noise to both x and the derivative, right? x may be a bit hard, but for the derivative, this is usually makes sense because you often have to calculate the derivative using finite differences from trajectory data. So that this is noisy is a very, very likely situation. And if I now recall the same um, evaluation, I will get these coefficients. So you see there was plus 10, minus 10 before, so this is completely wrong now, and we have a huge problem. Okay. And so also in the second equation and in the third equations, you get basically nonsensical results. And so let's try to use the lasso algorithm um, with a certain threshold. And you see that setting this lambda parameter to 0.1 gives me a nudge in the correct direction, but it's clearly not the correct solution, right? So this is much, much closer to minus 10 and plus 10. This is much, much closer to 28. This is close to minus 8 over 3. So I have, you know, taken this to the correct direction but it's still not perfect and certainly not sparse because I have many non-zero values. So one thing that we have not talked about until now is the problem that we can actually use uh, thresholding to manually kill weights that are of a small value. So all I'm doing now is I'm adding, uh, this is my lasso algorithm now, a lasso 2 version basically because it's slightly different, um, the implementation tool, you know, make it compatible with what comes now, but this component-wise thresholding is really what's, what's important here. And so what this means is you do the lasso over the non-zero weight. So you start with all indices are non-zero. You do the lasso over the non-zero weights here, and then you identify which weights to set zero if they are smaller than a certain user-defined threshold epsilon. Okay, so whenever you find a way to be small in the lasso algorithm, you set it to zero and you're never touching it again. So you're running lasso multiple times 
and using the thresholding, you eliminate weights that have been small before and never touch them again. And so lasso multiple times with this thresholding is what in the end will give us the correct, the correct solution. So the threshold algorithm just calls the component-wise thresholding. So what you're doing is this goes to component one, two, three, and for each of them you're calling the lasso multiple times and then sequentially if some value is smaller than epsilon, which was 10 to the minus three in my case, you simply set it to zero. And if we do this, this is the result we get. And so this is something we can actually be very happy with. We have used noisy data in x and in x dot, and we have identified the coefficients to a very high accuracy using the thresholding plus lasso example. Okay, so I hope this gives you a nice idea how this can actually be very useful for identifying systems from data, even if you have noise. And this also concludes our four videos on the lasso. So see you in the next videos for upcoming and even more interesting topics. Thank you.